Monday is Zoom Book Club at 7. Uh, Wednesday is Deacon's Meeting at 6.30 here at the church. Thursday, the Monday Thursday Communion Service is held at Jackson Center Presbyterian Church. Friday, the New Lebanon Community Church will host the showing of the Passion of the Christ. And next Sunday, sunrise service is to be held at Fredonia Park at 6.30. If it rains, that will be held at the Fredonia Church, not at Cold Springs. So, correction um, for your bulletin. And next, just two weeks, or three, May 1st, Lakeview Area Helping Hand Spring Night of Praise at Calvary Tabernacle in Jackson Center. And then Sunday, May 22nd, Ladies Spring Event to be held at 1 p.m. Light lunch is served, followed by a brief devotion time and painting. A delightful bunny with bow. Sounds like fun. Cost is $18, and there's a limit of $25. So let Sandy Ellenberger know if you're interested. Her number and email are listed. And I'm going to let you read the rest of those. Are there any other announcements? Does Ryan? I talked to Eric Peters, and he asked for the Fredonia Sunrise service that if anybody wanted to bring a baked good or casserole or anything for breakfast, that that be appreciated. Okay. Anything else? Thank you. 
we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. In faith and penitence, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Join me in the responsive prayer of confession. Away goes sword against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. When we lift the sword to Jesus for our neighbor, we have at times used our tongues like swords and in bitter words like our arrows of the others and of our Lord. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. I will turn my hand against the little ones. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two thirds shall be cut off and perish, and one third shall be left alive. The church has scattered. We have known to run away. Our children have gone their way. What part have we played in the desperate times our children face today? And I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them as gold is tested. Refine us like gold and give us strength to withstand the heat and the fire and not quite hot when the dross is scarred, that we might be grateful for the beauty of bringing our lives. They will call upon my name, and I will answer them. I will say, they are my people, and they will say, the Lord is my God. The Lord has won the victory over the world. Help us us to leave where we go. May we enter into our hope of Jesus and God's The Lord is my God. The Lord is our God. Assurance of pardon. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. May the God of mercy who forgives you all your sins strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep you in eternal life. time of prayer, it occurred to me too that we have some uh, some newer folks around uh, that maybe aren't used to how things go here. One of the things that you see me slipping in here as church has already gotten started sometimes is because I do serve at another church as well as this one, and their worship is a little earlier, and so oftentimes I'm slipping in a little late, and uh, that's just why we do that. So, in case you were wondering, why the preacher's always late? Yeah. Anyway. Uh, and my goodness, I'm sure it came up earlier in the announcements, but uh, if, you, uh, if you didn't weather the, the cold and didn't come out to go shooting yesterday because you were afraid of a little bit of cold, you missed out on some fun, some really good donuts, and the hospitality of the Clarks, and it was absolutely wonderful. Thank you again, and we just praise God for folks' uh, hospitality in this church. And, and by the way, if those of you that are wor- were worried about all of the, the killing of clay birds, we, we set a few free, didn't we? Yes. <laughs> fly away, little bird, fly away. I, I hope they're not an invasive species, that's all. So. <laughs> oh, golly. 
Joys and concerns. Are any, is there anything we need one like to lift up? Joys or concerns? Yeah, Mike. I have a, an older friend who uh, is a veteran. He's having <laughs> trouble. He's on oxygen, and uh, he's got a lung infection. His name is Davey. And uh, also a, a friend of mine whose name is Joe. Him and his wife are having marital problems, so lift up Joe and Anna, please, in your prayers. Mm -hmm. So we'll keep Davey in our prayers for his health and for Joe and Anna in their relationship. <coughs> Anything else? Yeah. Keep mom in your prayers this week. Her test came back and she does have lung cancer. Uh, so she meets with an oncologist on Monday. Mm -hmm. so her brother, my uncle John George, is not doing it real well. He used to have a new valve replaced, but he's not really strong enough to have that happen. Okay. Yeah. We'll keep and John in our prayers too. Mother, Susan in our prayers as well. Anything else? Prayer for our country. Of course, yeah. And prayer for the shut-ins. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Pardon? We are having a terrible time finding a place for my mother who has been displaced. She's 85 years old. We never imagined we'd be living her. She doesn't. She makes too much money to be in a senior high-rise type thing, and not enough money to pay rent. for that whole situation there. It's tough being caught in a lurch like that. Yeah. I, had, I had asked prayer for Johanna. She has been having really bad headaches. She's only on um, medication and she has been without headaches for the past mm -hmm. couple of weeks. So praise for that. Yeah. And continue prayer for my older sister. She's always dealing with health issues. Continue prayers for Becky's sister as well. Yeah. I have a friend that's having neck surgery tomorrow, so we need to keep her in our prayers. Okay. Anything else? All right. Well, with these things in mind, let us come before our Lord in prayer. Eternal God, you are mysterious beyond our ability to understand, and yet you appear to us in many and various ways. You appear to us in the parades of our life and celebrations, and you appear in the city crowds where issues are drawn and truth is trampled. Lord, we ask that you would hear our prayers. You are, you are in the countryside in peaceful places like this. You are in the peace of the woodland and in the drama of the abused and the addicted, in the chaos of the cities. And you hear all of our prayers. Lord, we confess that we, we are prone to fickleness. We alternate between cheering for Jesus like the crowds on the street and just like his disciples also turning away. May the, the drama we celebrate in this holy week come home to us with saving power. And may the, the celebration and the reflection on this holy week displace some of the, the chaos and the drama in our day-to-day -day lives as people of old bowed down and sang praises and some lined streets and shouted Hosanna to your son Jesus, we too praise him and we bow down before him. We like to think that if we'd have been there, it'd have been different, that that celebration would have continued. 
that had we been there, had we been there, we like to think of instead of a crucifixion, there might have been a coronation. But when we are honest with ourselves and we think deep within our souls, we know. We know that the result would have been the same. Only the names of the actors would have been different. So this holy week, as we remember that Christ took upon himself the sins of the whole world, we pray that we might be given the grace to accept the suffering and the burden of our sisters and brothers around the world as our own. The Lord looked at the city and wept. And so we pray for the, city's nation, the nation's cities and the neighborhoods in which we live. We pray in hopeful expectation for places of conflict like the Ukraine and Russia and Iran, North Korea and others. We pray for peace and a resolution to differences. We pray for wretchedly poor nations of the two-thirds of the world for places we've never heard of and places maybe we have, we've heard of but we don't know anything about, Burundi, Somalia, Mozambique, Sierra Leone, and, and more, where, where dictators rule and rob their people, where we, we send money and goods to help and to drill wells and do things only to have leadership destroy or rob, All they want is shelter and clean water. We pray for these situations. And as the people of the world come more to understand the need to protect the world itself, we, we pray for the air and the water and the land that you created and that you called good. As we struggle with the dilemma caused by the necessity to protect our environment and the desire to live our lives as we see fit, we pray for the world and for your nature and how you provide within it. Many of us here know very well, very well, how much modern science has helped us to provide for the world's hunger. And yet some of it's even come at a cost. Lord, help us as we get better at it. Lord, we also pray for your church as we join with millions of brothers and sisters this Holy Week. We pray for this congregation that we love and for the, the presbytery that it's a part of and her churches that we are a part of. We also pray for you for very individual and personal needs, Lord. We pray for, for these situations, for Davy and for relationships that are broken like Joe and Anna's and for, Lord, in situations our dear loved one, Sally, as she begins this journey with cancer. May she know that we are always praying for her. Someone in this church is always praying. That, Lord, we pray for others that we don't know. Folks like John and Susan, for Dottie's mom. Lord, we, we're thankful that for Joanna, she's been, re, uh, she's been relieved of the headaches. We ask, Lord, that that would stay constant for Becky's sister, for friends that are facing surgeries and treatments. Lord, for others that have been left unsaid, for, for those, Lord, that struggle quietly, that none of us are aware, those who struggle with depression and anxiety and all these things that if we haven't struggled with it, we struggle to understand and sometimes even judge and misjudge. Forgive us. And give strength to those who are struggling. For we are assured of one thing, and we'll learn in a little while through your word, that there is tribulation for all of us. But Lord Jesus, you overcame that tribulation. Help us to find rest in that. Enable us to recognize you alive and active in the world, in your church, and in the lives of the men and women who serve you. Come to us now by the familiar path by which your grace is known to us. Minister to our hidden needs and answer our silent prayers. Hear us as we join together in the prayer that your Son gave his church, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, 
hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us at this time return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. So, Lord, of that, we offer you with our gratitude a portion, and we ask that you would bless it, and that you would use it to the glory of your kingdom, that others might thrive as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Maybe may be seated. tell you this is this this is the one Sunday of the month that I have the hardest time coming to this church afterwards I walk in expect I, I know I'm going to smell something really good when I open the door to the family life center because it was men's prayer breakfast and I've heard talk all week about pepper bacon and all this good stuff and I'm thinking man maybe they left me a little morsel on the countertop nope nothing nothing it's in the fridge. It's in the fridge. Aww. <laughs> Falsely accused. All right. Sorry I picked on y'all. It sure smells good out there, though. I'll tell you what. Well, our scripture lesson this morning is from the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verses 25 to 35, of 33. And it is the continuation uh, of our discussion and teaching through the Upper Room Discourse. And this reading falls just before Jesus begins his priestly prayer. Let us pray for illumination in the reading and proclamation of God's word. God, our helper, by your Holy Spirit, open our minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, that we may be led into your truth and taught your will for the sake of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. John chapter 16, beginning with verse 25. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. For the Father himself loves you 
because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now, now we're sp you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered, each to his own home, and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. This is the word of the Lord. From some of the prayer requests this morning, I see where this scripture might have a lot of application. After years of studying and learning Greek and Hebrew, reading books that, well, some of the books that I've had to read and study, I have to admit I probably didn't read much of them because they'd be better used as book doorstops. Some really big books they make you buy in seminary, right? And they fill my bookshelves. And still sometimes I have to admit, Jesus, why don't you just say what you mean? Like in verse 26, in that day you will ask in my name, and I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf. It almost seems like it's two different topics. For, it shouldn't be in one sentence. Then there are those times when I think that I got it. Or I, maybe I'm just too embarrassed to admit that I really don't got it. And I quote the disciples, oh, now Jesus, I get it. Now, now you're speaking plainly, Jesus. And he says, do you now believe? And so, like many of you, when I'm asking the age-old why questions, or if I'm sitting with someone and trying to minister to them who are going through some tragedy or grief in their life, and they're asking the why questions, and I feel helpless because I feel like I should have an answer, and, and even if I do, it's, it doesn't feel like it's good enough, or maybe what they want to hear. But the answers... If they are answers at all, all are hard to believe. And there you go, belief. There's a sticky, deep subject. One must believe to come to having the peace that Jesus speaks of in the reading. And so, like is often the case in this world, today I have bad news and I have good news. Bad news, you will have tribulation, as has been witnessed in the prayer request today. And the good news, Jesus has overcome the world. Amen. And hopefully that's why you come here to hear about that once in a while. The good news, right? It's like I always say, Jesus is the answer. So if you don't have a good answer, and we used to say this in the seminary all the time, worst comes to worst, Jesus. You can never go wrong with Jesus. Always a good answer. Always. Jesus has won the victory over the troubles and the pain of this life. If we but believe, we will realize the victory has been won for us. And we will have the peace that Jesus promises, that joy and that hope in the eternal glory that goes beyond all understanding. And some of us, it's easy to see in our faces, in our lives, that we've had our tribulation. And some of us wear it quietly and secretly. I couldn't help but thinking of the old favorite hymn we love to sing, and we'll sing it today, I promise you. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning, and then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. It gives us comfort, but 
Do you notice in the story, or in the words of the, the, the author uses, saved from wretchedness. He gave his life, his groaning. That's not like warm and fuzzy, feel-good stuff. See, to win the victory, it implies there was a battle. To win the victory, it implies that somebody might have given their life for that victory. For glory. I mean, think about all the, the past, I, I, you know, we can picture in World War II when they announced on VE Day and the people were dancing in the streets. You remember the picture of the Navy guy kissing the girl? Nobody knows who they were or whatever. Was that VE Day or was that when Japan? I can't remember. But anyways, but you've seen those, those pictures, right? Or, you know, when there's been some big victory and, and they have parades and all this stuff. But my goodness, people died for that victory. Soldiers lost their lives. Innocent people died. And like today, we hope that today, that peace comes and there's victory in the peace over in Europe. But we know people are dying for it. So when we sing that song, there's been something, something that's happened here to provide the victory for this person in this song who's had wretched, been saved from wretchedness. Brings, just brings more questions. Hi, oh, yeah, yeah. Jesus, just be plain. Grant me the understanding to be the Christian you want me to be. And Jesus responds to each one of you here today with, and in this reading, and we'll hear more about it if you come to Monday Thursday service, I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. That in the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. It's interesting, Jesus says, I've overcome tribulation. Hmm. He's overcome the world. Somehow that verse does give me peace, though, and it gives me a lot of hope in spite of my world experience, but I still struggle. How about you? Jesus has overcome the world, yet tribulation? What up? As the kids might say, right? Well, let's go back to the beginning of the reading. In the first paragraph, it's all about Jesus speaking in figures of speech, in parables, right? And, and he also talks more about his and the Father's relationship. He states again his love and his Father's love for each other and for the disciples and for their belief. But he ends this line of thought with this statement that he's leaving the world and going to the Father. And the disciples respond, now we get it. And Jesus says, really? Now you believe? Now you get it? Jesus is definitely mocking the disciples at this point. He's giving them a hard time in his response, his, to their response to saying they understand him. In some translations, like the NIV, you'll read that Jesus' response ends with a ex big exclamation point, a big punctuation. And then, like in the ESV, which I read from today, that read to you from today, it'll have a question mark. It doesn't matter which way you translate, the, whether it's a question or an exclamation point, all you have to do is look at the context of the sentence. And you know, and Jesus knew, the disciples would abandon him. They would deny him. So Jesus mocks them, like, really? Now you get it? No, you don't. And then he even says, the hour is now approaching. It's here. They're about to run away from him. Jesus tells them how they will treat him soon. Now he refers to the prophet Zechariah. Zechariah 13, 7, we, we went through it in our, uh, the prayer of confession this morning. As I, I was looking at it, I couldn't help myself and see some parallels to today. But he says, in verse 7, he says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. Jesus has told them over and over again in the upper room discourse and he, that he and the Father are one. And he's prepared heaven for believers. He's served the disciples. God washed the disciples' feet. In Jesus' act of washing their feet, Jesus tells us and the disciples that we're already clean, but we need cleansing of those day-to-day -day sins that we track in on our feet. And yet, they are still confused, and so are we. 
And then throw this statement on top of it all. He predicts their betrayal and abandonment in his hour of most need. When the man Jesus could have cursed the Father, he claims the Father. He hangs on tight to the Father and the Father to him, for they are one. His Father is in perfect unity here with him. And here's the greatest part. Because Jesus and the Father are one and they clung to one another in that most desperate of times, Brothers and sisters, when you deny Christ, when you backslide, maybe is a good word to use, when you run away from Jesus, he's still hanging on tight to you. He will not let you go. He claims you. Even when we strike the shepherd, Jesus and run away from him. He will still claim us when we cry out, My Lord and my God, save me. He will. If you don't believe that, look at the, that's what the whole story of the prodigal is about. And he will grant us the peace that he speaks of in this last verse. I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart, I have overcome the world. In our present day's context, it's hard to speak of peace. We're not actually at war as a nation, at least not yet, like other countries, but you never know. We hear about the Ukraine, of course, and all you got to do is turn on the news and hear about the violence and the drama in our cities, maybe even in our own communities. We can relate to the disciples' confusion. Times were similar in many ways. Uh, for, for Jews at that time and those the disciples, it, they had peace as long as they kept the peace. Then the Romans were all good with everything. Just don't cause any trouble. Maybe he grants us the most peace in our lives by filling uh, p these peace-filling words of the day as he finishes the sentence just before he begins his prayer when he says that, in the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I've overcome the world. You know, I hate to be a wet blanket, but Jesus acknowledges tribulation in the world. He admits, yes, in this life it's going to be hard. Yucky stuff's going to happen. Really yucky stuff's going to happen. Even as you believe, you will suffer and experience grief and pain. But take heart, I've overcome the world. But he didn't say he overcame tribulation. I don't want to focus too much on the tribulation part. But we see it all the time. This is important to state regarding tribulation. This may answer some of the why questions, although we don't want to hear the answer. Jesus... Jesus couldn't win the victory over sin. He couldn't win the victory over the world if he had not walked through the valley of his own shadow of death and onto that cross. Remember, in order for there to be a victory in battle, somebody's going to get hurt. Somebody's going to die. Jesus died to win the battle, to win the victory over sin in our lives. And, here's the, and that sounds great. Except for this part, this tribulation thing. that we He's implying we're going to walk through tribulation. And I've heard a lot of your stories, and we've shared those stories through our prayer concerns every Sunday. We've witnessed death. We've witnessed people suffer and struggle. And we will continue to. Because Jesus promises tribulation even to the believer. Because in order for us to know the peace and the joy of Jesus Christ, that peace that goes beyond all understanding, you've got to walk through your tribulation too. Don't shoot the messenger, please. Because I know some of you are pretty good shots. Whether we realize the victory over this world while we are still alive and living in it, or after we awake from our our own death, 
we will have peace, peace in Jesus Christ. We will experience the victory in Jesus if we but believe. He gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. And I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Some of you might be wondering, hey, hey preacher, it's Palm Sunday. What up with this? Doom and gloom, we're supposed to be celebrating and going, Hosanna in the highest, right? All right, all right, I hear you. King Jesus won the victory. The leader in the battle. Hosanna in the highest for sure, because only the King Jesus who rode on the foal of a donkey, humble and lowly, born in a manger to poor parents on the wrong side of town, an insignificant town, a foot-washing a foot washing God, a sinner-befriending Lord of hosts. Only that Lord can claim victory. But it couldn't come without first walking through his own valley of the shadow of death. It's like the old saying, it's true, you know, that just... Just when, and those those of you from the book study that were in the 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 uh, the the, um, the one about the devil and that whole thing, right? Screw tape letters. Thank you. Yeah, you know, you know, the devil. He the ones the ones that are already like constantly sinning and being bad Christians and like trying to be the good Christian in, in public, but then they get live this other life. The devil's like ah. We got that one covered. He don't have to work on that that one. But the ones that are the ones that are beginning to get a relationship with Jesus, the ones that the ones that are, man, they're just on fire for the Lord. Man, the devil loves them ones. Those are the ones he's got to work at. Those are the challenge. And they are the biggest payoff. And so I heard this when I'm looking at this and talking thinking about tribulation and the challenges we have in this life when when the attack seems to come on to us and stuff. I, I love, I, I happen to hear these words from, in our, it's very contemporary in our world today, when uh, I heard these words from Denzel Washington considered, consider, concerning the, the slap heard around the world, right? We, we all know what, right? You know what that is. I mean, if you don't know, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good for you. Scott, you're right there. So, so he said these words, and, and well, I, so I would theologically be like, eh, but I get what he's saying. Denzel Washington saying these words, well, there's a saying, when the devil ignores you, then you know you're doing something wrong. The devil goes, oh no, leave him alone, he's my favorite. Conversely, when the devil comes at you, maybe it's because he's trying to do something right, and for whatever reason, the devil got hold of him, meaning Will Smith, that night. There's some truth in that statement. Reality in Christ is this. The only peace that we will have in this life can only be found in Jesus Christ. He won the victory for today and for tomorrow. So whether it's, it's your own poor choices, whether you're collateral damage to someone else's sin, or whether the devil's truly on the attack. The only peace you're going to find is in Jesus Christ. He won the victory. Peace, even in the midst of tribulation. And not having the answers I think I need or others expect. Peace. Peace. I have peace in Christ and I pray that you do too. Because of the tribulations of Christ, I know I will be brought into his victory over the world and into his glory. This is my hope, and it's not, it's not an idle hope. It's not pie-in-the-sky thinking. This, this, it's not an idle speculation about the future. Our hope is a conviction, a conviction that's grounded in the victory of Jesus' death and his resurrection. For our present and for our future belongs not to this world, but to our God. So whether you're coming from a place like the author of the hymn, hymn comes from, of speaking of blood and groaning and ugh, heavy stuff. Or maybe you just struggle with the day-to-day -day stuff. Chronic aches and pains. You know, like I was on my feet too long yesterday at our shoot having a good time. And this morning, my knees are killing me. You know, 
seems insignificant compared to other struggles, but they're the struggles that we are weighed down with. And sometimes we're prompted just to agree with the wise old sage who once said, yesterday when it was tomorrow was too much a day for me. I love that line. Some of you are from. It's a very wise, wise individual said this. Yesterday when it was tomorrow was too much day for me. The wise old sage, many of you know well, Winnie Pooh Bear. No bother. On your good days, be thankful. And on the bad days, be grateful. For Jesus said these things to you, that in him you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, because Jesus has overcome the world. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we know too well some of us are going through the, the depth of tribulation even as we speak. Many of us have been through our own tribulation. We've come out the other side and we understand all too well the peace that goes beyond all understanding. We've experienced it. And we know too that we have, we have children and grandchildren and friends that are facing tribulation and we're afraid that some of them are about to step into a season of great tribulation. We pray for those situations and we pray, Lord, that you would give us the courage and the energy and the bombacity to stress to them that tribulation is part of this world, but there's hope and there's peace can be experienced in it and we've got an answer for them that it comes in Jesus. And we're willing to share that good news. That Jesus, you've overcome this world. Lord, we pray our thanksgiving for your word as it is read and proclaimed. Amen. Why, we just have to sing victory in Jesus. scripture read and proclaimed and it is worth hearing as we prepare to depart from here that Jesus had said these things to us that in him we may have peace that in the world we will have tribulation but we're to take heart for Jesus has overcome the world the apostle Paul relates to this and shares too with us that therefore my beloved brothers and sisters may this be our charge today let us be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord our labor is not in vain. You know, our Lord is triumphal. We hold these palms, and I know some of you, go ahead and pick them up. They're laying on the pew next to you. Grab your palm. May this palm, whether you lay it on the car seat or the dash, and over the next few weeks it withers up, crispy and dry, or whether you hang it on your fridge or somewhere in your home. Or, but when your eyes fall upon it in the days to come and today, may it be a reminder that King Jesus is Lord of your life, that he has overcome the world. And when things get tough, you can depend on him for peace, a peace that goes beyond all understanding. And the world won't understand it because it's been defeated. Jesus won the victory. Hold this up as a banner of the victory that Jesus has won over the world. Know as you leave this place that no matter our tribulation, our hope is in the victory of Jesus. May we be blessed in the knowledge and the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ during this holy week and forevermore. Hallelujah. Amen.